uh, finish up our discussion today with pancreas cancer and local advanced disease. Uh, SWOG S1505 study looking at new adjuvant approach and pick the winner of fulfurinox versus gem, uh, gemnap paclitaxel. What I've personally found most provocative about this, the study is that uh, upon central review, a third of the patients were actually had irresectable disease or metastatic disease that was missed on review. Um, it's obviously heartbreaking to a patient and highlights the importance of disease management team discussion and uh, a radiologist and a surgeon that's highly specialized. Uh, Zev, um, what are your thoughts about the data and uh, how did it change your practice if at all? I mean, we all know that the majority of pancreatic cancer, even when resectable, is actually micrometastatic disease. And, and that perhaps distinguishes it from the, a lot of these other cancers. That, So uh, to me, um, when it turned out that it's a third of them, and, and some people think it might even be more of those resectable patients had actually metastatic disease, essentially it's not, it's not asking the question about resectability anymore. It's asking a question about survivability and 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 how that impacts uh, you know whether there's a difference in these two regimens um, from from the perspective of it changes the power it changes everything because if you really knew you were going to have a study of unresectable metastatic disease this entire study population would look entirely differently from what it did it's probably reflects uh, the reality though and how we approach patients with resectable disease which we, which is that if you're not doing uh, you know, uh, triple phase CT scans and MRIs of the liver, sometimes you're missing small areas of disease in pancreatic cancer. So from a clinical perspective, I think it sort of shows us there may not be a difference between these two regimens in terms of um, long-term survivability, um, as was kind of the secondary endpoint of the study. Uh, clearly, there's, uh, the, the, you can get patients to surgery safely at the end of both of these regimens. And I think pancreas cancer um, perhaps needs to have, as they've done in Japan, but not yet in this country, needs to have be turned maybe into a situation like gastric cancer where all patients, regardless of resectability or not, get neoadjuvant chemotherapy beforehand. So, so that's, and that actually there was a phase three study last year at JASCO in, in, in Japan that showed a survival advantage in patients with resectable pancreatic cancer who got neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So um, this, maybe point. points, well, this maybe points out that that might be a good strategy for us to consider more. Um, so so Jeffrey, time, you have a 56-year-old woman who's very fit and otherwise healthy that comes in with a relatively you know, small, uh, clearly resectable pancreas cancer. Um, and she just wants her best shot at cure. Uh, you know, are you thinking a uh, new adjuvant or would you evoke sort of the French data and uh, say that adjuvant fulfurinox is her best shot? Let's take, take her an operation now. What, how would you just, what's, what's, if I'm a fly on the wall in your clinic, what would you discuss? So, you know, uh, the practice here at my institution is to give pre-op because we've been doing it for like 20 years. So the habit is not to take patients to surgery. Um, one, one argument is, and it may or may not be valid, is if you do pre-op therapy, you gain some time for manifestation of you know, peritoneal disease or other metastatic disease, and you can save somebody from going to a big surgery um, so I think we have sort of stuck with that. Um, of course, other approach is also valid. I think if you've got a tradition, it's like a gastric cancer in Japan, you know, you go to surgery first or in China. So I think they're both valid. Dan, what would you recommend to that patient that we discussed? Uh, outside of the new Alliance study that just opened that's looking at this question of full adjuvant versus perioperative fulfurinox before and after surgery, um, I, I think I would agree probably most centers, at least academic centers, have moved towards neoadjuvant, a neoadjuvant component, whether it's total neoadjuvant or, or at least a sandwich approach is debatable. But um, we definitely review all of these at conference, which I think is important. And then 
ultimately it's tailored to the patient. But I would agree with Jeff, or there's a lot of advantages potentially of starting with neoadjuvant therapy, even in the completely resectable uh, tumor, getting early chemotherapy on board for micrometastatic disease, enhancing our zero resection rate, and allowing really aggressive, nasty disease to declare itself and spare patients from surgery. So I would offer this patient chemotherapy if they were eligible for it early before surgery. I agree, and I'm glad you brought up the Alliance study. Do you want to talk a little bit about it and uh, so that to highlight it and to raise awareness? Yeah, sure. I mean, so the, the main questions are, in addition to say this, this study, SWOG um, 1505 that we were talking about, was like, what chemotherapy to use? You know, is it fulfirinar, so gem, nabhagitaxel, but it's also like when to use it, right? And so are you going to use sort of the uh, protege adjuvant for six months? Are you going to do some before, some after, or are you going to do total neoadjuvant? Each of those are their own question. And some of these studies, like the, the most recent SPAC studies, trying to ask, I think, in my opinion, too many questions at the same time, and you get 20 patients in a forearm study, which ultimately is very difficult to discern any information from. So the Alliance study is asking one of these questions. Both arms are getting full Fearnox, but it is getting standard of care, surgery, then uh, adjuvant full Fearnox for six months versus perioperative full Fearnox with three months before and three months after. Um, so that'll at least help to sort of um, address that question in a randomized phase two setting. And the important thing, just to add on to that, it's a very important study, and I, I really encourage everybody to participate. There it'll be essential, like as you saw in SWOG 1505, how many patients truly had metastatic disease. So really to answer that question, they're going to have to do a better job, I think, screening out those patients um, in some way who have me metastatic disease. Um. Uh, the other uh, point that I found surprising and uh, eye-opening is quite how toxic gem and uh, napaclitaxel can be, um, and perhaps um, that how com comfortable we're getting with administering fulfirinox. Um, um, so uh, this was a great discussion. Uh, other th final thoughts, words of wisdom? Uh, I'll say one thing about the adjuvant setting where you know, if you're looking at, say, just the median overall survivals of, say, that SWOG study and try and comparing it head-to-head -to, -head to some of these other sort of adjuvant studies like the Produce study of adjuvant fulfirinox, and it's substantially lower in the SWOG study. But I, I think we have to realize, though, that those are highly select patients that get into the adjuvant studies because they had to get surgery, do well, be well enough to get adjuvant therapy. And so already many patients have fallen out there Whereas these studies like SWOG uh, 1505 is enrolling at newly diagnosed. And, and so it's not allowing for all of this. And we even talked about how many of these patients were already stage four and locally advanced and couldn't be resected. So that I think explains that. And so I wouldn't have that deter us from doing these neoadjuvant studies um, and just keep that in, um, in mind. Completely agree. Do you find the liquid biopsies are helpful uh, for you in pancreas cancer, what is the setting that you use in, if any? I think liquid biopsies in pancreatic cancer are a big challenge. They, they I mean, we uh, first of all, genomic profile of pancreatic cancer is, is a big challenge, generally speaking. We don't usually see a lot of alterations outside of KRAS, P53, P16. It's, it's a pretty similar and unfortunately not very um, actionable group of of targeted genetic mutations. I think more importantly with pancreatic cancer now, the emphasis is to do germline testing and to identify those patients um, in that way, uh, you know, with the BRCA mutation. So um, I don't routinely do circulating tumor DNA in pancreatic cancer because I've never found it to be particularly compelling as, a, as something to act on. I agree with that. Great. A uh, big thanks to my guests today, Dr. Johnny Cavanacci and Weinberg, for their lively, informative discussion. Thank you again for sharing your expertise and for our viewing audience for uh, giving us an opportunity to discuss these topics. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our presentation uh, of Oncolive GI Talk and see you next time. <laughs>